she was able to join a band of guys that had equipment and a van and everything else. And, um, you know, um, when she tried out for a band that was uh, holding um, tryouts in a local garage, it was a couple of the original members of then, it was called Whiteheart. Um, and they hired her and she fell in love with the, the brother of the guitar player and they started with her they called it heart and then about a few years later when i'd gone to college a little bit and decided to kind of find my way as a solo artist then i finally joined her band when it was called heart already so um there was a lot of you know stepping stones before there was even a real amplifier or a, a drum kit involved. We played everything for, we played all kinds of little bands forever. Schools and churches and, you know, parks and um, even a drive-in theater one time. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Now, I, I understand that in that beginning, you eventually ended up moving to British Columbia in Canada. Uh-huh. And she, then, sorry. Yeah, she fell in love with the guy who was at the time a draft evader during the Vietnam War, Mike Fisher, the brother of Roger, who was in the band. And she followed him up there because she fell in love with him. And so the rest of the band followed her up there because there's no singer like that you can ever find in the world. And you were with the band when they got the call from Rod Stewart's tour manager to join him in Montreal? <laughs> Yeah, we were playing in this dive, sort of a dinner dance club called Lucifer's um, up way up in Canada somewhere. And um, they had a dress code and, you know, they wanted you to never swear or chew gum or wear you know? anything that showed you midriff on stage, you know. So there were, it was kind of a square place and we were not squares. And so we and made a kind of a unfortunate comment from the stage about the food at the place that was all it was all in you know bins with sterno flames underneath and she commented that it was kind of tasted like lysol and got us immediately fired we got a call like right away to come and open for rod stewart in montreal across the continent in a few days because his opener had something happened. So we got on the cross country um, you know, train to, to Montreal from Vancouver. And it's a beautiful country, you know, there's lots and lots of beautiful scenery. And we got there and opened for Rod Stewart. And it was the first big, real big stage we'd ever played on. and. People had actually started to hear um, Magic Man on the radio there at that time because we had Canadian content, it's called, you know, because we were, and was a dual citizen of Canada. So anyway, long story short, they all lit up their, their matches and their lighters. And it was like one of those moments you never forget. It was, there was a constellation of, you know, here comes the future and it looks like the universe is opening up to us. All these little lighters in the dark, you know, like stars. So it was a, a meaningful, uh, you know, beginning when the first album had just come out. Now, why the guitar? What possesses Nancy Wilson to pick <laughs> up the guitar? Well, the Beatles mainly for one thing. We. As, as like an eight year old, I'd seen the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan show, which was um, like a lunar landing. It was like a cultural flash mob at that moment because they were so different from all the sort of lily white music that was happening on the radio at the time. You know, Perry Como and really great singer, you know, great music, you know, Sinatra um, and stuff like that. Kind of novelty music but and country music 
I was, we were from a musical family. We all sang, we all played ukuleles and piano and stuff, but then it had to be guitar. So we got guitars immediately, started making little bands together with our sister Lynn too. Um, the three of sisters of us sang a bunch of, you know, um, Everly Brothers songs and harmony songs and Beatles songs mainly. I had to learn every Beatles song that you could learn. And it was an obsession. And I really f took to the guitar. Like, I was really instantly just good at it. It was easy for me because I had a good ear and I knew how to find the sounds I was looking for, how to figure out how, how chord structure worked. And being a, a musical family to begin with, I think just had laid all the groundwork for me to have the music theory and the structure of music already in my head to be able to be a guitar player. So I was really um, hell bent on getting good at a very young age. And Anne was already, her big facility was singing. So I was the accompanist, although we both played, you know, guitars too and sang, but she just had this gift of a voice and so we knew we had this natural ability that we might as well pursue and we pursued it and we learned our craft and we got proficient uh, at a very young age and we're just obsessed with it so when we started you know playing out and really when i finally joined heart and band at the time um and i was a good player and i could sing and i had already done solo shows on my own, you know, just to earn money to buy a better guitar and albums. But um, I never ever in a million years thought I would do anything except for music. And that's exactly what happened in my life. And I feel really super lucky. The more, you know, my kids grow up and they're trying to find their way and figure out what they want to do and all that kind of stuff. I feel so blessed that I already had that in me, that the drive and the ability to pursue my bliss, which was music. And I've never had to look back. <laughs> what was it like during that time? And I'm talking about the seventies. Here you are, <laughs> um, a pair of young women. You yourself are <laughs> a naturally gifted guitarist yet you're trying to make your way in this male dominated field. How did you manage that? Well, you know, having started at age, basically I was good by the time I was nine on the guitar and, you know, whatever, wherever I would go and play at a party or at a music store where I'd try other guitars out, sit there and play stuff, people would stop and kind of gawk at me like, whoa look at that little gal with that great big guitar she could really do you know she knows what she's doing so i kind of got a little bit um ego i got an ego with it you know like i it's like yeah i'm good yeah yeah <laughs> dig me now avoid the rush you know because i really was impressive on the guitar so um so i didn't till it wasn't till later that I've learned by people's reactions that it wasn't what girls are normally supposed to do. Like I was a kid before I had a gender identity of any kind to speak of. So I was just a little tomboy that played a really good guitar. And later people was like, wow, you're pretty good for a girl. And it's like, yeah, well, I'm just, I guess I'm just a person. Maybe I'm pretty good for a person, you know? So it was an interesting dynamic as it, as it grew up and kind of learned that people really didn't expect that. <laughs> you mentioned um, the people who inspired you. At this stage,
I think throughout the arc of this career we've had, luckily had for this long, um, we do a lot of meet and greets and talking to fans and or just people that we met and um, to a person, the, the women in, in particular are like, I never would have been brave enough to try to play the guitar if, if I hadn't seen you play the guitar. So, um, which is a, the ultimate compliment because, you know, but my mom said it would ruin my nails, you know, <laughs> just like when I was, I never, you know, was going to be a hand model, obviously, especially after playing guitar all this time. But uh, and the way I play is not delicate. It gave women a empowerment, you know, to see me and Anne up there fronting a band with in a muscular way, in a leadership role as a creative leaders, songwriters, and just front person people. So, um, and we had strength in our sisterhood and our relationships always been strong. So, you know, we, every, for everybody's first question in most interviews, it's like, do you fight? Do you guys fight, you and your sister? And, you know, We've never been petty people. We've always been military, ethical people. We grew up in the military. So we have an ethic to hold the line, you know, to be a tight knit um, fighting unit and to survive uh, by helping each other through it. Um, and so there were many situations as leaders of the band and the decision making always fell on us to figure out how to agree how to lead the band and you know you you learn how to compromise and you figure it out and you do you know you don't take sides you work together you learn how to communicate you know like america ought to be doing better these days but um but it's it's a military ethic and it's a uh it's a good idea, you know, to agree to differ and then work things out by communicating and get in both sides giving a little to of make course. the decisions happen. Now, on June 7th, Nancy Wilson's heart is going to be at Falls View <laughs> Casino, the Avalon Theater. What type of songs are we going to expect to hear? Are you going deep into the catalog? Yeah, we're going to do we're going to do a little bit of a deep dive into the heart catalog um, with songs like not a one which is kind of the per, the precursor to the song mistral wind from the doug and butterfly album we're doing those songs together like on the album and i hadn't done i'd never really done not a one and so a lot of people re requested it for a long time. And so I went, okay, I better try to learn that. It's like, so how does that go again? <laughs> you know? So I had to go to like uh, YouTube and get an instructional video about, you know, how do I, how do I play that again? <laughs> and it's a really cool part. Um, and then I realized it was, it wasn't exactly correct. So I, I kind of, I, it all came back to me and then I remembered how it really was supposed to go. And stuff like that, we're doing uh, the obvious fun, you know, heart songs like Barracuda and Crazy on You and, you know, a bunch of the Even It Up, a, some, a few different spins on some, some classic heart material. Um, but then we're, we're gonna learn a couple of things that songs I love that are covers like End of the Innocence, Don Henley song. Great song. I've always wanted to sing and um, just a really great song. And and then there's a there's actually a Van Halen song called When It's Love that we're gonna try to pull off. So we'll see <laughs> see how that goes. But uh, there's a couple of fun covers and a lot of heart stuff. What what is the song of all the songs that you've you've played and written? What is the one song that when you're just noodling on the guitar you give right. it a go? 
Well, if I'm trying to play a guitar, like check out somebody's guitar, like, hey, play my guitar, see how it feels and see how it sounds. There's just some parts I usually play, like parts that I've used, like back, back pocket jam stuff that I've used in various score songs and I've used in uh, actually in songs I've written um, that are just parts I like to play that just feel good to play. And I'll note that it'll tell me what a guitar, the character of the guitar I'm trying to play if I play that part or that other part that's sort of in the key of E, you know. <laughs> but um, anyway, yeah, I don't play song, I don't play a heart song if I'm sitting down and playing, because I've played a lot of heart songs at other times. <laughs> yeah, but no, that, that, that's some great insight. I mean, you've had, you've had a really solid career with some epic music. Somebody would say yeah. the anthem of their childhood or their teen years. Yeah. yeah. And so it's, it's interesting how, you know, they mean so much to all of us, but sometimes yeah. you're like, yeah, maybe I want to do something else. Well, you know, I, yeah, it's it's really fun to play the heart songs. I don't get tired of them. And, you know, um, but when you've played something f for years on end, not always the same, obviously, but it's not the first thing you think of when you want to just noodle around. <laughs> now, you've got a project near and dear to you now um, off stage. It's your Roadcase management company. What can you do? What's the yeah. goal of Roadcase? Roadcase um, so far has only two people signed to uh, to our company. Um, one of them is Madison XOXO, who's actually my husband, Jeff. His son, Jeffrey, because Jeff was always in music, various forms of music and entertainment, television, movies. And Jeffrey has those ears, like he's got golden ears. And he's always um, finding somebody who, before they are big, who is really amazing. And Madison XOXO is one of those artists. She is a trained musician and she plays everything and she sings really great and she writes and really cool songs. So I was just recently in Portland, Oregon, where she um, works and has gone to school. And I did too, actually went there um, to school there. But I, I uh, played Magic Man with her, you know, on at her EP release party there. And she just killed it. It was like, oh my God, who would have thought somebody like 25 year old Madison would want to sing a heart, you know, a song like Magic Man, but it was really fun. She has a great band. And I have another uh, graphic artist, uh, uh, Sketchy Goat, who's done a whole bunch of posters and stuff for a lot of the Seattle rock people along the way, including me. And uh, we just signed her. So she's going to get She's a super humble person who never charges anything. I'll, I'll just do everything for free. We're like, no, you can't do everything for free because you're really talented. You have to give yourself some more credit here and charge You know what you deserve for your work because it's really beautiful work. And so we're just kind of slowly but surely building our repertoire, our roster, I guess you'd say. Um, but we're not in a big hurry. We we really, I feel as an artist who's been in this business for so long, I mean, I hate to even call it a business because it's, you know, it's my calling for so long that, you know, I have, I've, I've earned all this kind of respect inside of that world that I want to try to give some of it back. Because I think these days it's harder for the young ones to try to get heard you know that everybody has their little niche of fan base but unless you're taylor swift or something you know there's you just want to help spread the word and and uh, you know spread it out over so that more people can hear more great stuff i want to thank you so much for your time today thank you you've been very gracious